foremost, I'd like to welcome you all virtually, and it's a pity we can't all be in a room with tea and scones. Um, but that's how life is at the moment. Um, my name is Shirley Clarkin. I'm the Heritage Officer with Monaghan County Council, and uh, this is one of our projects um, that we've been doing this year. Um, just to say, if you would all stay on mute until the presentations are over and then there'll be a chance to put in some questions and you can put them in the chat and then I can moderate them then at the end. Um, this project has been funded by Monaghan County Council and the Heritage Council and I'm going to do a five minute presentation first of all and then I'm going to hand over from our wonderful team from Flynn Fernie Environmental or Ecologists and so that will be Louise, Ian and Jennifer. And um, I'd like to thank them for their hard work of uh, surveying that they did all summer um, in good weather and bad weather. OK, then. So um, let me see if I can move slide. Next slide. OK, so the Monaghan Heritage or the Biodiversity and Heritage Plan, the newest iteration of that, that's the third one that we've had over the last 15 years, was adopted by the Full County Council last November. And in it, we have a very strong focus on climate change and biodiversity loss, running as really cross-cutting issues through all of the actions in the plan. And um, this is to recognise both the very seriousness of both of these issues, um, and indeed they're both interrelated as we know, but these are serious um, contemporary societal concerns and environmental concerns with which we need to be concerned. And that's why the Biodiversity and Heritage Plan is focusing on them. And you can see there our mission is to protect, conserve and advocate for our biodiversity, our tangible and intangible heritage. So that would be cultural heritage buildings and monuments and intangible things like folklore and place names and contributing to sustainable development, to the sustainable development goals and to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And our vision is really that by 2025, the climate change and mitigation and adaptation, sustainable communities, functioning ecosystems, health and well-being is generally accepted in the county and crucially embedded in the activities of Monaghan County Council, because as everyone knows, we do need great system institutional change in order to get where we need to get to for, for carbon emissions by 2030 and indeed for biodiversity loss. So in the Heritage and Biodiversity Plan, we have 13 themes and these were put together following consultation with the public. So just those little icons there are um, memory gadgets for me and others to remember what themes we have in there. So let's see if I can remember them myself by using uh, the themes. So from starting from the top, so we have the dragonfly, so that's Monaghan's wonderful wetlands. Then the leaves, we're moving to native woodlands and hedgerows. Um, the bovine there is for high nature value farmland. The squiggle is actually the profile of the wonderful archaeological monument, the Black Pig's Dyke. Then we have megalithic monuments. We have um, historic buildings, vernacular heritage. Um, then also we have our domains and estates. Then also we're looking at people and our border heritage and cross community work. Um, graveyards, historic holy wells, um, our um, language, both English and Irish, and our use of English in County Monaghan, and then our intangible heritage. And then the world is actually for climate change and all our cross-cutting issues. So those are the 13 themes that we have in the County Heritage Plan. And then to the right of that, you can see our hedgerow and native woodland. So what we have in the plan is really a large broad theme so that we can adapt the plan as we go and then we have an indicative sort of action plan to go with it. The action plans probably will change over the next five years but the theme will remain the same. So for hedgerows and native woodland we have that we're, we are aware of the ecological and cultural role of hedgerows and native woodland and we are aware of their inappropriate management and removal and we will create awareness and build capacity of landowners for their management and reinstatement and celebrate good practice. And the very first thing we had on that action plan was to resurvey our tw in 2020, or this year, 2021, our 2010 heritage survey or hedgerow survey sites. And the team who surveyed will go through that now in about two minutes time. 
And we also have in there workshops um, to produce the Heritage podcast or film. We did do a podcast this summer with Jennifer, who's here, and you can listen to that on Spotify or Apple Podcasts at Heritage at the Heart. And if you look through the five episodes there, you'll find one on hedgerows. And so you can pretend you're out on a summer lane on a summer day and uh, enjoy that through your headphones anytime. And then also to look at the native woodland sites in the county. So that's just a brief overview of where we are and why we're doing this survey this year. So that's the contact details for the Heritage Office, should you wish to find us if you're not familiar with us already. We obviously have an email, which now seems a bit old fashioned, um, a website, which equally seems old fashioned, and Monaghan Heritage Forum Facebook page, and also we are on Twitter. So without further ado then, I just want to read a little poem. And before we start from Jennifer, Ian and Louise to give the results of the Hedgerow survey. And I wish to read this poem because it's from a girl from Donegal and she's called Mary Turley McGrath. And she recently spent time in the Truong Guthrie Centre and sent me this beautiful book. And I just wanted to read this poem because I think it's extremely relevant. So, before speech. These never talked. Trees, water, flowers all speechless, have no words, gestures, expressions, no force can make them. But if taken from us, we who have words for everything and nothing would become smaller, sadder, lifeless beings without these wordless things. And above our Earth, space station crews circling the planet every 90 minutes say, how beautiful it is, see, how land has been consumed by cities, how forests have dwindled, how ice fields on Kilimanjaro has, have melted. So I just wanted to share that with you before we start and just in, particularly in the context of those who are circling our planet and those who are going on space tourism and maybe we should look closer to home. Um, okay then, so um, can everybody see the County Monaghan Hedgerow Survey screen from Flynn Yes. So I'll mute myself and hand over to the team. Thanks very much. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to kick it off here. Um, and thank you very much, Shirley, for that lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Ian Douglas. Uh, I'm here from Flint Fernie, uh, along with my colleagues, uh, Jennifer and Louise. Um, so we're just going to give you uh, 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 basically a rundown of, of our results, but also just kind of give you some uh, context for, for hedgerows in general and also just kind of speak about good practice and, and what we should be Sorry. kind of moving towards uh, over the next couple of years. Um, so the value in our hedgerows our hedge, hedgerows are interesting because they're not just a, a, a physical landscape feature. Uh, yeah, uh, hello. Yeah, Ian, if you turn off your camera you because off? your okay. your, wi your, your Wi-Fi is pretty poor, so if you turn off your camera, it might help your the voice to come over. Thanks. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Hi. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, our our hedgerows um, they're important physical features in our landscape. Um, and but historical features, you know, a lot of them were planted two hundred to three hundred years ago. But some, um, like the ones we find on county boundaries, uh, and the ones we find um, around uh, um, around townland boundaries, go back. Uh, thousands of years. So, so they're a treasure trove of cultural uh, heritage, but like anything that's been around for that long, uh, biodiversity uh, also gets to take hold. Um, so they're hugely important um, uh, for the flora and fauna and um, for different things related to water quality and also as as you, you know, uh, infrastructure, uh, valuable infrastructure on our farms, and an important uh, an important resource uh, that uh, within the context of farming. Um, 
so if you could just kick on there, Louise, please. And um, so we have uh, looked at hedgerows using um, the hedgerow appraisal system. So this was published by the Heritage Council, uh, I think, in about 2010, um, and it's aimed to create a standardised system for the evaluation of the natural capital um, and condition of our hedgerows. Uh, what they wanted to do was to find a way to um, take a baseline uh, of, of where our hedgerows are at um, and, and so we could see change over time, but also try to find what the biggest problems were and um, so we could be more focused and more directive uh, in, in how we go about fixing them. And um, so the way we looked at uh, hedgerows here is uh, we the main areas we looked at were uh, floristic recordings. Um, so we were interested in the abundance um, and the diversity of the trees and shrubs we found in our hedgerows, uh, of the climbers, um, of the ground flora and of the ferns. Um, we we're also concerned about the structure of our hedgerows. Um, so what kind of shape they're in, are they, how high they were, how dense they were, um, how big the gaps were and how many gaps there was. Um, we also looked at the historical significance and the landscape significance of our hedgerows. So we checked on the old OS maps. Were they were they there uh, when the first maps were produced? Um, do they have connectivity to other landscape features, features like woodlands and wetlands? Um, where do they sit in the landscape and how important that would be? And then from from and then one of the most important from a modern context is different techniques that we're seeing. Are we seeing fillet cutting uh, and uh, what's been the impact of fencing um, and and what's been the impact of other other things that are causing hedgerow degradation? Um, so I think we can move on there. And now I'm going to hand you over to Louise and Louise is going to go through some of the um, some of the some of the findings of our report so far. Perfect. Uh, that's the results slide up there. Can everyone see? Yeah. Perfect. OK, so as Ian said, we had different categories for our floristic recordings and the shrub layer was one of those categories. So this is just a small snippet of the species that we found when surveying. Um, in total, there were 35 species identified in the shrub layer and 20 of those species were native plants. So uh, we can see here the asterisk denotes introduced species like sycamore or the snowberry here. So our most common uh, hedgerow shrub was hawthorn, and this came out at about 94.4% of the hedges, very similar to 2010 when it was around 95%. Uh, blackthorn is still the second most popular uh, species found the shrub, and it followed holly, which was similar to 2010. So one moment. OK, so uh, in our 30 meter sample strip, the average number of species found was around 3.5 species. And this is actually less than 2010 when around 3.62 species were found. The number was much higher in townland badger hedges, and we found in general that these townland badger hedges were more diverse for all of the first categories. Um, so obviously some of these hedges date back to mid 14th, 15th century and yet yeah, their their history and obviously their diversity of flora means that they're optimum for protection. And 13% uh, of our hedges only contained one species. So this was a significant increase in monospecies hedges since 2010 when it was only recorded to be 3% of the hedges. So yeah, there's basically a decrease in um, diversity there. And the UK Biodiversity Action Plan defines a species rich hedge as one that contains four or more native woody species. Uh, this was found in 23.3% of our sample hedges. Uh, again, it decreased from 2010 when 37% of the hedges were uh, shown to be species rich. And obviously there's issue with this because the less diverse the hedge is, the less the range of flowering times and the less uh, food and resources providing for nature. 
Uh, it's also a problem when we don't have as many native, native species as they're generally um, more important for biodiversity than the non-native counterparts. So uh, second first category recorded was the th tree layer. Um, I think here we had around 25 different species and around 20 of those were native. So the most common uh, tree species was ash, and that was around 74.8%. Uh, hedgerow trees were recorded as present in around 87% of our hedges, which is an increase in the recordings of trees, a slight increase. And again, ash is the most common species. And that's followed by hawthorn and willow, um, and sycamore was fourth. So the problem with ash uh, being our most dominant hedgerow species is obviously ash dieback. So this disease is prevalent in Ireland and it's expected to cause the death of the majority of our ash of our ash trees in the next two decades. So when we sampled, we found that 90% of the hedges that contained ash also displayed signs of dieback. And this obviously has implications for landscape, for agriculture, biodiversity and for climate. Uh, in this case, it, underplanting and replanting of dying ash with alternative native species should be implemented as soon as possible, um, obviously to try and counteract this effect. So in terms of this, we also checked uh, when trees were present, if they were predominantly immature, immature or predominantly mature and mature. So uh, the good news is there is less hedges that just contained mature species that in comparison to 2010 but there is still a lot of hedges that were either mature or predominantly mature and that's obviously an issue when we think about the continuity of these hedges especially when considering the fact that so many of our hedges do have ash trees and so many of those ash trees are going to experience ash dieback. Uh, an increase of ash in the canopy of the trees was also seen, and this is probably also related to the amount of ash dieback that was found. Um, we can see here, we basically, it's basically uh, split into categories of over 25%, 10 to 25%, and then less than 10% or none. So we found that over 25% was around 36% of the hedges uh, in comparison to 2010 when that was only 10%. So ivy is actually beneficial for a lot of wildlife and it's the native food plant for a lot of our birds and our invertebrates. But it becomes a problem when the tree is in a state of natural decline and it can infest the canopy and basically cause the tree to become top heavy. And when we have like strong weather conditions or strong winds, uh, this can cause the trees to topple. So um, that's obviously not great to see, but it, it is probably in relation to the amount of ash dieback. Uh, there's also a decrease in semi-natural semi grasslands for the adjacent land class. So a semi-natural grassland would be one with a low input of fertilizer and that hasn't been recently reseeded basically. Um, it's important for livestock, for pollinators, but also uh, as resilience to changing climates, uh, semi-natural grasslands are more drought resilient and better at retaining water than the improved grassland type. Uh, so this was good to see um, in 2010, around 45% of the fencing was found to be fixed to stems. So that's decreased and we found it only to be around 15%. So this is obviously a practice that's not commonplace anymore. And that's really, really good because obviously it's um, not great for the trees. Uh, in terms of fencing in general, then post and wire was really the most common method of fencing. And there's still uh, a lot of fence, a lot of hedges that had no fencing at all. So um, in these cases, sometimes there, there might have been drains, et cetera. So was it necessarily that the, the hedge was the, the main barrier for livestock? And another category assessed was the amount of gaps in the hedge. And again, we have four categories. It's greater than 25%, 10 to 25%, 
five to 10 and then less than five or, or no gaps. So there's obviously a significant increase in this category, the category, sorry, of over 25%. Uh, only around 3% of the hedges in 2010 had greater than 25% gaps. And actually, we found that this number was around 36%. So there is a general decline in stock proof hedges, and it kind of points towards uh, reduced, reduced management. So uh, Jennifer is going to take you through the rest of the results. Thanks very much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Louise. Um, so I'll just talk about um, another facet, which is degradation of hedges. Um, and we talk about banks, walls and shelves, which are the, um, the types of structures that hedgerows would be uh, planted on. So a bank is like a bank of earth. A wall would um, include like an old stone wall. And that's not very common in Monon. It's probably more in the West. Um, and then you have a shelf, which is sort of um, like a drop between um, one piece of farmland and another. Um, and that's generally the three types that you would find a hedgerow uh, planted in. So um, in terms of degradation, it's not brilliant news. Um, hedgerows with no degradation um, ha has uh, fallen. And then uh, the amount of hedgerows with severe and minor degradation has unfortunately risen quite a bit in the last 10 years as well. So um, next slide, Louise. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the uh, picture there just shows an example of um, a degraded uh, hedge uh, where you can see some um, degradation along the bank. And unfortunately, um, you know, poaching by cattle um, leaves uh, the roots exposed. Um, often maybe the uh, cattle are up to the very edge of the field, which and there's no verge left, um, which means that um, poaching is very, um, uh, it's very, uh, uh, has a lot of effect on the amount of degradation and it means that the hedgerow is more susceptible to disease then as well. So that's just another picture of an exposed bank um, and you can see, you know, it's, it's not that healthy looking. So um, in terms of management then, um, the flail, the mechanical flail is the most common tool that's used for management and you've probably seen some of them out and about recently um, since the 1st of September. Or, well, at least they should have been from, since the 1st of September. Um, so it's um, it's quite a powerful machine and uh, it often um, cuts the hedgerows in different types of profiles. So um, it can be a cut box profile, um, it can be a shape, um, or cut one or both sides. Um, so the cut box shape is is very popular and um, especially with the mechanical flails, but um, unfortunately it's not always the best for biodiversity um, because the uh, hedgerow will not grow back um, as much as it should. Then you've got your short-term unmanaged and long-term unmanaged. And we found that long-term unmanaged hedgerows had increased quite significantly since um, the last uh, survey was done. And that's just an example of a flailed blackthorn hedge. Uh, you can see that it's quite exposed and um, it's been very roughly cut and that leaves it more susceptible to, you know, disease and dampness setting in. Whereas if it was cut sort of more cleanly, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely better and it's easier for more growth to come back the following year. Um, in terms of assessing conditions, um, so uh, Ian might have mentioned some of this earlier in terms of uh, structure, we would have looked at the width, profile and density of the hedges. Um, we looked at the amount of gaps that they would have had. Um, I just spoke about the degradation there and uh, we also looked at the nutrient rich species, species. So nutrient rich is not a positive thing in general. It, it's where uh, you would have a lot of growth of uh, nettles, uh, docks and cleavers and things like that and it reduces the um, species rich richness of other flora and also the per percentage of ivy in the canopy so as uh, Louise mentioned that has quite increased since the last survey as well. Um, so the uh, amount of hedges in favourable condition um, since the last survey has um, unfortunately reduced 
um, quite significantly. You can see um, in the photograph um, that would be an example of, of quite a well maintained hedge. It's quite um, healthy looking and it's got a verge of one or two metres on um, on the edge, uh, which blocks it off from the farmland and gives the uh, species a chance to grow uh, along the verge. And then you've got um, hedgerows in unfavourable condition. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, these have, have risen. Um, so you can see there an example. Uh, you have a lot of nettles and um, nutrient rich species um, on the verge of the hedge. You've got a lot of ivy, ash dieback and um, quite a bit of gappiness in the hedge as well. Um, so that's unfortunate um, that that has risen in the last 10 years. Um, so in terms of nutrient rich species, which I've just mentioned, you can see that um, there's, there's been multiple instances in, in our survey of slurry, which has been spread too close um, to the field boundary, um, which means that you'll often get this kind of film of, of slurry and fertilizer over um, the vegetation on the edge, uh, which, um, you know, is, is quite unfortunate because it, it leaves it more difficult for that vegetation to be healthy and to grow. Uh, it in interferes with the photosynthesis process and all the rest. So, um, you know, that 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 strip of one to two metres at the very edge of the field is quite crucial in keeping that healthy. Um, so I'll just talk uh, about policy and legislation. Um, Ian mentioned at the very beginning, uh, you know, hedgerows have been a feature of the Irish landscape for a very long time, and um, back to the Bronze Age, I believe. Um, but uh, they became very prevalent in the 17th to 19th centuries when we got the Enclosure Acts, uh, which came in, and this coincided with the privatisation of lands, and they were split up. And the best way to do that, they thought, was with hedgerows, um, which is a great thing because um, they're they're brilliant highways for biodiversity, and especially currently. Um, we have a lack of native woodland um, in the country, so hedgerows are, are brilliantly beneficial for biodiversity. Um, and there's three uh, main types of legislation which uh, protect hedges. So you've got the Wildlife Act 1976, as amended 2000, Section 40. So uh, you may have heard um, a lot about this, like between 1st of March and 31st of August, um, that's the period when you're not allowed to cut hedgerows, except in uh, certain circumstances. Mainly that's to do with road safety issues and um, uh, there might be, you know, road, uh, sort of housing developments and things like that. But um, that ties in with the Heritage Act 2018, Section 8. So uh, 2018, I think there was a little bit of um, controversy because uh, they were threatening, the minister at the time was threatening to perhaps reverse the legislation and include the month of August um, as a hedge cutting period. But due to a lot of fight back from environmental groups and the public, they decided to um, keep the month of August in there, thankfully. Um, and as I mentioned, the Roads Act 93, so under that um, part of it is uh, road safety for um, cutting back of hedgerows. The last three there, uh, you've got environmental impact assessment or screening regulations. Um, so they came in in 2011. And basically, that means that if a farmer is to create uh, a farmland up to uh, five hectares, um, a field up to five hectares, or uh, to remove hedgerows um, up over five, 500 metres, um, Ideally, he really has to get or she has to get um, a screening done. Unfortunately, County Monaghan is the only county uh, that we've seen that hasn't had had uh, any of these screenings done, which is unfortunate. Um, then you've got the cross compliance um, regulation, which is basically where if uh, a line of hedging or, or drainage ditch is to be removed and um, since 2009, the um, a farmer or landowner should uh, mean should replace this um, uh, before they actually carry out the works. Uh, but unfortunately, it, it's quite weak and, and often it's not followed up on. And finally, then the nitrates derogation. Um, if a farmer is involved with this, um, they need to uh, manage their hedge in two different ways: either um, allow a thorn bush, like a hawthorn or blackthorn. Um, to, to stay every 300 metres within the hedge, 
or um, the other one is uh, to um, cut uh, their hedge, uh, a third of their hedge every three years on rotation. So um, there's a bit of bit of management involved there if, if the hedge is to be healthy. And then finally, I'll speak about the cap reform and eco, eco schemes. So the um, common agricultural policy, um, currently we're on GLAS 3, and GLAS is the Green Low Carbon Agri Environmental Scheme, which will run until the end of this year, and it includes uh, quite a few measures on hedgerow maintenance. Currently we're on REAP, which is the um, results-based environment agri pilot program, and that will run to the end of 2022. And on the right hand side, you'll see uh, part of the assessment there includes um, the different conditions of hedgerows and um, over 1.5 metres in height is good. And there's lots of vegetation happening there in A and B, whereas in C, um, unfortunately, that's where you have a lot of gappiness um, kind of um, badly cut and um, growth uh, doesn't occur as well as it should. Um, so we think that the reforms in CAP um, that are coming up will be more results based and there will definitely be um, more focused eco schemes that will hopefully include better maintenance of hedgerows. So thanks very much. I'll hand you over to Ian. Uh, so uh, back so to me now, um, and I'm just going to speak about uh, good hedgerow management. Um, uh, the way we manage hedgerows is uh, some of the thinking behind it uh, can often be misguided or, or based on on, on on kind of strange ideas. Uh, so some of the reasons that are often cited for for cutting hedgerows and for giving good reason for 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 cutting your hedgerow. Level, like like the on the left of this picture is to let light into your grass and um, to 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 improve visibility on the roads but often i i i i've heard of people just wanting to be able to see their cattle over the hedge and um, uh, there's also a very antiquated notion of uh, tidying up the countryside and keeping everything nice and regular um which you know is 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 something that's in 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 all of us, we all are like our tidy gardens and and everything else. But that's that's a, a kind of a longer term change that we need to consider, um, and also just to create more room for grass and for crops. Um, which is true, you will get more room for your grass and your crops, but you'll have to ask how much money you'll have to spend to do that, uh, and and um, what the what the cost benefit analysis is for you to do that, and also the impacts of doing it. So. But hedgerows do have to be managed. Um, uh, so real honest reasons for cutting hedgerows uh, that stand up are to maintain a soft roof barrier um, to keep the vegetation away from wires uh, and gates and fences. Uh, so anyone who's got electric fences will know that uh, if you if you don't keep your vegetation back, they'll just earth. And uh, also to manage scrub encroachment, particularly if you've got a lot of gorse in your hedge or um, a lot of uh, black tort. Next slide there, please. Um, so we'll just show some examples of good hedgerow management. Um, and so we have to think about it um, from our needs, from the needs of, the, of our enterprise, uh, whether it's beef or, or sheep or, or crops. Um, but also, we also have to be considerate of the needs of wildlife. Um, if you're in, 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 if you're in a dairy system or a beef system, uh, which would probably be the two most popular uh, in Monon, you know uh, your animals need shelter. If they're out early in the spring, like the wicked hard spring we had this year, um, you know they need to be able to they need to be able to get in against the hedge to give themselves give themselves some some um, some shelter. And but also you have to consider the heavy weather uh, the hot summers that we have as well. So if, uh, having a good, robust hedgerow is going to give animals shade. Um, and if it gets too hot for cattle, cattle will lose condition and lose weight. Um, and you know, you're going to you're going to stop getting the gains that you're, you're going to need to keep your system efficient. Um, it can be expensive to cut hedgerows as well. Um, you, you're talking uh, upwards of three or four hundred euro uh, to do a box cut on both sides for uh, maybe 200 meters a hedge. So depending on 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 how much cutting you have to do, um, you could be easily throwing a lot of money away for things like tidying up the countryside or having being able to see your cattle over the hedge. Um, but you also have to give it 
a broader context. We have to think about how important these things are for for things that are struggling in our in our in our, in our natural society. Um, so hedgerows are so important for for the likes of our hedgehogs, our butterflies, and um, for the invertebrates, the ladybirds that help our our, our crops. Um, so when 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 you're thinking about managing your hedgerow, think about why you're doing it. Think about your profits. Think about the holistic needs of your enterprise, um, and think if this all if this management strategy is going to work for you. So we we'll just look at two different. Uh, kind of broad methodologies for managing our hedgerows. So the traditional management was laying. So this beautifully laid picture we have here on the left. So that's cutting through uh, live trees um, and laying them over and stitching them all together to create a stock proof, living stock proof fence. And um, that's going to last you longer than any post and wire system. Um, it's a bit of work initially, but it's obviously uh, it, it's a great, it's great end result. Um, and look, we're not going to say that we're all going to go back to this uh, style. We would love to see communities and other people doing it um, and farmers doing it to an extent because uh, it's great for biodiversity and shelter and it's a huge part of our, our country's heritage. Um, what a good modern uh, hedgerow management techniques uh, were shown in this picture below. So as you can see in this picture, we uh, have a nice big thick elder head hedgerow um, five or six meters high. And it's also important to remember that if you, for every meter um, of your hedgerow, you get three meters um, of shelter on the opposite side. So that's maybe four or five meters high there. Um, so that's 10 or 15 meters of, um, of, of, of shelter on the other side. So what, we, what we're looking to do is we're looking to get that fence back about two meters from the base of your hedgerow. That stops your animals getting their heads over and, and pooching and biting and, and browsing in it when you don't want it. Um, so that gives this lovely little grassy verge where we get a, a chance for flowers to grow, where we um, get a, a opportunities for insects and for uh, uh, predatory things like uh, um, spiders. Um, so then when we want to go and clear that, because obviously we can't leave it like that all the time, we whip down the wire uh, and we can either let our cattle in at it and, and they'll they'll thank you for it. They'll love the opportunity to get in there and to, to broaden their diet, you know, to do some browsing, uh, to eat some fruits and some nuts, uh, which are really important for macronutrient or micronutrients uh, in their diet and also just helps them uh, live a more natural life um, and is good for their animal welfare. Um, if we're going to cut it, uh, what we'd look to do is flail the ground um, and flail the just take the front of it. Don't have to go in too hard or too deep. Just cut it back so it's at the same amount every year. Don't even cut up too high. Just cut it, cut it as high as you need. But you probably don't need to go any higher than two meters. Um, so just on our next slide now, we're, we'll just look at um, how we go about uh, uh, establishing uh, new hedgerows and uh, the management of young hedgerow. So if you look even on a lot of the Chagas stuff, they'll tell you that a hedgerow should be a, a white thorn hedge and people love a good thick white thorn hedge. And that's fantastic. But if you just keep a, a box, a tightly grown uh, white thorn hedge and don't let it out, it's no use It's for biodiversity. So what we really want is to see uh, species diversity. You know, we should be looking for eight or 10 different species. Um, we can still have white thorn as 50 or 60 percent, but we ideally we want to get some oaks in there and some hazel and some wild cherry and crab apple and rose. Um, it's going to give us, as Louise was talking about earlier, the different flowering times. So you're creating a continuum of food resources throughout the growing season. And we also want to think about it from things that grow tall and things that grow bushy. And um, so what we can do there is we can if 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 we want to prune our hedge, we can prune them back, uh, prune back our hawthorns there in year two to five or six inches off the ground. And then you'll get a good basal density in your hedgerow while still allowing your 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 more your trees proper, like your cherries and your 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 oaks and and that to grow up and get away. Um, so you'll get that multi leveled effect as well. Uh, with time and then you know we're getting into the system of where we breast it 
in, in the coming years. And if we need to top it, we can we can top between the big trees and just leave the uh, leave the leave uh, uh, leave the big trees to grow and just cut the things that are growing bushy. Um, how we go about establishing something like this? Um, so it's been shown that if you want to get a hedgerow going well, um, the best thing to do is to prep the ground first. So if you can get in with a digger, or if you're really organised, get in with a plough at the end of your summer, um, a plough with a strip of ground, hit it with a harrow, um, and if you can get some get some sort of a mulch. So you can see in this picture here they used. Um, they use wood chip, but you could use straw and uh, you could even use grass if you want. That's going to make it easier for you in the long term and then it's going to keep weeds down. But it's also going to protect your young trees from drought um, and also uh, give a source of slow release nitrogen and and, and and carbon for your for your young and your developing trees. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to take it doesn't have to take a huge amount in a room. So this picture here is from a scheme um, where they planted three, uh, 300 metres of a hedgerow in a five hectare field. And that only worked out at less than 2% of the uh, of the entire area of the field. So, you know, if, if you're a farmer and 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 you can't and you say you can't afford 2% of the grass area, it's, it's not going to make your business viable. You know, your prob your business is probably under a bit of stress. So we can make room for things like hedgerows. We just have to um, we just have to have a good mindset and 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 obviously funding funding and and support from from the government and from uh, state authorities is also very important. You can hit on there. So just uh, to summarise the results of our hedgerow survey. Uh, so hedgerow species diversity is in decline, unfortunately, uh, in, in the county. Uh, monospecies hedgerows are more common uh, than in 2010. Um, ash is still the most abundant tree in our hedgerows, uh, and that accounted for 72% of hedgerows with tre uh, of trees with inside the hedges. 90% of our sampled hedges, uh, which contained ash, sadly showed ash, signs of ash die back. And, you know, that's it's not going away. That's going to be here for, for good. Um, Reduction in the practice of fencing to stems uh, was seen with benefits to tree health. A 33% increase in hedges with a large percentage of gaps um, was observed. Uh, increases in severe and minor degradation of banks, walls and shelves. So the actual, the, the, some of the structures of our hedgerows. Um, and a 10% increase in hedges with unfavourable conditions. A 10% decrease in hedges in favourable conditions. So uh, kind of equating to the same thing. Uh, and 40% of hedges containing uh, over 20% nutrient-rich species, so your nettles and your docks and your and your uh, creeping thistles. Um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing the quality of our hedges going down, um, the the diversity of our hedges going down. Um, so we really need to think about how how we're selling hedgerows and and how we're valuing them, um, and then how we're encouraging farmers to make the right decisions. So that's about it from us. Um, just to say uh, many thanks to Monaghan County Council and to the Heritage Council uh, for making this possible. Big thanks to Shirley and Sandra for all your support and for, for bringing us on uh, board for this project. Really fun one. Uh, out and about during the summers uh, in, in nice weather, uh, rambling around the fields of Monaghan. Um, I think farmers probably didn't know what, what to make of us in most of the cases. Um, big shout out to, to Neil McKenna. Uh, who was a huge part of this project. Um, he he done a lot of our surveys and he's the first ecologist to bring an umbrella surveying with him. Uh, we all thought he was mad, uh, but now I think we're all going to invest in an umbrella for winter. So um, thank you very much and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Um, Thanks to Jennifer and Louise as well for that uh, very comprehensive presentation on the um, hedgerow survey results for this year. And I suppose I must say um, that it's, you know, it's the results are pretty stark and there's a lot of detail, detailed, um, um, I suppose, characteristics that are surveyed as part of that report. And you can see that on one of the very first slides that comprise the floristic diversity, the tree species, 
the condition of the hedges and even the structural composition, whether they're gappy, whether they have wire, all of those types of characteristics as well. And then, of course, the percentage of hedgerow species uh, or tree species in the hedges, um, primarily com comprising ash, 90% of which are demonstrating um, signs of ash dieback. And then, of course, the nutrient enriched species would show that we have both an increase in species which can tolerate nutrients and a decrease in species rich grasslands adjoining the hedgerows. So I suppose all in all, those results said to me that there's been an, an intensification of land management, but a decrease in the management of the biodiversity features. Um, and um, we will take questions now. So if you wish to put one in the chat, I see one coming in there from Brian. Um, or if you um, wish to um, put your hand up. So Lorcan Scott um, has asked, and he's said, well done all. Would it be possible to estimate the carbon loss between the baseline report 2010 and the 2021 review survey? Well, uh, that's a tall order, I would say. We'd have to, we'd have to um, quantify the age class of all the trees and have figures for how much carbon are sequestered by trees, species. Um, I suppose it could be done roughly um, Lorcan, um, if anybody from the team has a, an answer to that, um, please come in. I don't know of um, a proper hydrocarbon survey yet, but maybe there's one out there that we could use as, a, as some sort of a, an equation to work it out. Um, so I, I have a little, little word on it, not much. Um, it could in, in some ways be uh, figured out. Um, so as a broad brush figures and you can see how broad they are um that um a, a, a hedgerows have the potential to sequester somewhere between 0 0.6 and 3.3 .3 or 3.5 tons of co2 per hectare per year so if we were if we were to assess the area uh, of hedgerow that's lost and the kind of density of it we would be able to get some number but it's it's like all of these things um, it, it, they're hard enough to um to estimate in in real time uh, but uh, twice as hard to estimate retrospectively uh, but mm. we can we can we can definitely make an assumption that the trend uh, the trend is towards a loss of co loss of co2 capture as opposed to uh, co2 drawdown yeah, I suppose I suppose we could certainly say there's the, uh, the gap or the hedgerow that's lost. We could quantify that in some way. But I suppose from the point of ecosystem services, looking at the figures, you would possibly you could possibly establish that the carbon sequestration function has declined in the hedges based on the survey. To what degree? Um, I don't know. Or you maybe you could say that they're no longer acting as a sink. Um, because they're not being managed properly. Um, and then Brian asks, were there particular survey sites or areas? And if so, were, there se were they selected? And we could definitely answer that. Uh, were there parts of the county that were worse, better than others? So um, who wishes to take that one from the team? I can actually show you this. Sorry, right. I'll just quickly go yeah, back to there. Yes, yeah. I think we might have actually. So uh, we basically resurveyed the sites from the 2010 survey and they were chosen by a random sampling method. So I think uh, sample squares were chosen at a certain distance and then inside those sampling squares, uh, random hedges were chosen. Uh, we also did a survey of hedges that are connected to native woodlands. So the results that we've actually uh, talked about here are from the baseline survey, but uh, in our report that will be published, we'll also have um, some results that will be about uh, these native woodland sites. And could you say if um, were the parts of the county that were worse or better than others? Um, say that? I wouldn't like to say that. <laughs> no, I. Yeah, well, I, I it's some, I suppose some areas were, but not like specifically parts of the county. Um, I suppose we can, as we go through the results, that, that'll probably become a bit more clear as well. But yeah, I think it was very general, realistically. It was kind of... Well, we can't say, can't we? We can say that, that the, the hedges that are older, that are the old townland boundaries, are more floristically diverse. 
and that the ones that are connected via a corridor to a native woodland site are also more diverse. That was yes. certainly the 2010 findings and I'm assuming they're similar. Yes. Yeah, the, the townland boundary uh, hedges definitely were. Uh, the native woodland hedges, we still have to do the analysis of a few of them, but okay. it looks to be the case. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, Brian um, wants to know if the problems were worse, worse in improved grassland areas. And Joe Shannon wants to know, does the team feel that the cap reforms will have any significant impact on hedge restoration? Um, so um, what about the improved grassland and the native grassland sites, the comparison? Um, is there a comparison that we could do between those, I wonder? Um, I think for the species rich uh, hedges, they were um, really beside the improved grasslands as well. So uh, I think that's kind of one one thing that we can look out for. But we could definitely, I've that written down. So yeah, it could be possible to try and look at uh, a correlation between lack of diversity and improved grasslands. It could be very interesting to see. Yeah, just to have yeah, a look. Have yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the cap reforms. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about this recently. Obviously, they, they were looking for a 5% biodiversity gain on farms, even though I think farms might have 10% at the moment. Um, but I think they've got 4%. Um, and then there are all, of course, the results-based payment schemes that are in the country at the moment, which are geographically um, designed to be kind of, um, I suppose, site specific or you know landscape specific um so does the team feel that the cap reforms will have any significant impact on the hedge restoration um who don't want to take that one um i can maybe try um just just from what i've seen recently it seems that um uh, like the eco schemes to date in the last sort of few years, like the REAP scheme that's going on currently and um, some of the last schemes definitely have taken hedgerows into account and there has been quite a lot done by farmers in that respect who've been part of the schemes. But um, it's unclear at the minute exactly what eco schemes will be under the cap reform that's coming in from 2023. Um, I think it depends on the take up as well. Um, but it will be more results based yeah. definitely, um, which is promising because to date maybe um, it's been it's been unclear, uh, you know, what what effect um, hedgerow and grassland management has had. Um, I think it's promising, um, and I think there definitely will be more um, sort of uh, emphasis on hedgerow management. Um, but it's it's hard to say at the minute just how effective it'll be until they're put in place. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Well, certainly, I hope that these results will feed into something um, useful for um, agricultural practices in the county, and certainly we'll be endeavouring to get this report into as many hands as possible. Um, Lorcan again said that the Heritage Council supported a Birdwatch Ireland project this year called farmland bird hotspot mapping project. My goodness, it sounds like some sort of a, <laughs> a fun day out for birds, but um, which should overlay very nicely on your work. Well, thanks Lorcan, we'll get that mapping detail um, from you. Um, if you can share it or Birdwatch can share it, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Fergal um, asks, did any hedgerows surveyed show evidence of providing habitats for fauna such as hedgehogs, bats, etc.? Anybody? Ian? Um, I, I could jump in there, I suppose. Um, yeah, well, a hedgehog, hedgehogs, um, hedgehogs are a funny one because they're so prevalent. I actually found one in my garden last night and I don't know if I've seen a hedgehog in five years. Um, oh. So they're, they're, they're always to know what they're doing. Um, but <laughs> but hedgehogs would be, would be quite prevalent in all of our hedgerows. Um, bats is an interesting one. Um, with the bats, we would uh, you would you would f expect to find bats in big old mature trees, trees that have holes in them or have lost branches or have bits that are rotting in them. Um, so we would have found evidence of that uh, here and there. Um, bats 
also do a lot of roosting in old buildings and old houses, particularly ones that are stone. Uh, one thing that we might see, uh, now this is just my own theory, but one thing that we might see with, with, with ash dieback is that a lot of these big old ash trees that are left standing are going to become very holy um, and 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 rot from the inside out. So we might actually see that these that these dead ash trees are, start becoming kind of important important roost sites for bats and for other birds that are making a comeback like 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 woodpeckers. Um, so yeah, I'd say I'd say uh, there could be a bit bit in that. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, OK, so that seems to be um, the end of the questions. Um, just to say that the report, when it's completed, which will be in the next uh, month or so, um, will be available on our website. And um, But as you can see, there's a lot more to do here. Um, we have engaged with Chagask, um, with Catherine Keena, and we'll be certainly uh, working with her to see what can be done about these issues. Um, Hedgerows are very important in the landscape in Monaghan. They're important for wildlife corridors and species movements. Um, they're important, obviously, for carbon sequestration, if we could quantify it, and for loads of other um, functions, such as nutrient um, absorption, actually, even though that seems to have a detriment on the hedgerows themselves, on their floristic uh, um, diversity. Um, so um, we have a lot of work to do, I suppose, and this survey actually points towards us having a lot of improvements to make um, and it has to be a collective effort between even the planning service of the local authority, our environmental section and indeed um, landowners and communities out there and certainly we need a lot more advocacy for hedgerows um, and their benefits. Um, so I'd like to thank you all and um, we have all your emails so we can send you the summary report when we have it um directly to your inbox uh, should you wish it and um to once again thanks thanks to our team for their survey work uh, to jennifer to ian to louise and to neil um and also to billy um of flynn fernie who are our local um ecological company and um, who are very excellent in all the work that they do and I agree with Brian, we need enforcement to stop ongoing destruction of hedgerows, absolutely. And that agricultural regulation that we can see that's not been implemented here in Monaghan is a key factor in that, actually. Um, so um, thank you very much, everybody, and continue to advocate for your hedges. And we'll try to get some good resources up on our website with regard to hedges and their management, et cetera, um, so that we have a little bit more information up there for everybody. Um, so thanks again to our funders, to the Heritage Council, and to Monaghan County Council and um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon and uh, go out, m move forward and mind the hedges. OK, thanks very much, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.